Well, good morning, everyone. We're about to start. I'm going to kind of take some um, COVID sticker seats. Well, good morning. Welcome to our Tip 30 service. It's good to see so many of you here today. And a big welcome for those who are joining us on the live stream. Let's start and celebrate our time together with the song, Praise the Lord. Please join me now in a word of prayer as I open the service today formally. Let's pray. Dear God, we have come together to meet with you, to express our fellowship with your son Jesus, and take our part in the building of your church. We praise and thank you for your goodness towards us, to hear from your holy word, and to pray for the world and for ourselves, particularly in these COVID times. We pray the message of your son will dwell richly within us as we teach and encourage one another with the wisdom you give. We pray for Alex who will give today's sermon. May I allow him to speak clearly and faithfully so your words can be reached to everyone here and also those watching our live stream. And whatever we do, in word or deed, may it be done in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and for his glory. Amen. All right, so today we're continuing our sermon series regarding Advent. And Advent as we learned last week, it's that special period uh, leading up to Christmas. We get to really reflect and celebrate um, 
uh, the birth and, uh, of God's Son, Jesus Christ, and what that means for us. And last week we looked at the topic of hope, and this week we're looking at the topic of peace. Now, peace can have a different meaning to different people, can't it? So I guess you're thinking, you ask someone in Australia what peace is, you might get a very different answer to someone overseas in a war-torn country about what their definition of peace is. And even close at home, in my house, if you'd ask my children, uh, Kelly and Jessica, what their definition of peace is, they'd probably um, say something along the lines of, peace is when it's, you know, when it's really quiet, um, it's un- unusually quiet at my household, the Wong household, and I say to the girls, girls, do you hear that beautiful noise? And the girls go, yes, Dad, silence, peace and quiet, we get it. So yeah, so that, that's what peace is in our household. But I suspect that we're going to hear about different meaning of peace today after Alex's sermon and um, what the Bible has to say about that. So looking forward to hearing that later today. All right, I'm kind of hand over um, for our church family time. Our, our sister Sarah to come up. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Carl. Good morning, everyone. Well, as we're on the topic of Advent, uh, I have a bit of a confession to make. It's that at Christmas time, I'm normally a little bit of a Grinch. This time is not a season that fills me with excitement, but rather with weariness. Uh, Rather than anticipation, I often feel apathy. But this year, I've decided to turn over a new leaf, and I've decided to be excited for Christmas, and particularly for Advent. I think Carl uh, helpfully reminded us that this is a season of waiting and of anticipation. And I think the two reasons I'm most excited this year is because I'm marvelling at the fact that Jesus Christ came down and he um, joined his creation in such a real and tangible way. And the second reason is because this act of coming down to earth in the form uh, of a man and as a baby is so closely tied with his act uh, of his death and resurrection on the cross. And so as we celebrate his birth, it's always in the framework of his death on the cross as well. But if you're like me and you're often a Grinch around this time, but you're trying to be different, you might need some ideas for how to celebrate Advent and to prepare your heart uh, for the birth of Jesus uh, that we celebrate on December 25. So I've just got a few ideas here that I've put together throughout the week, so you don't have to go searching the internet. They're all here for you already. So I'll just run through them. Um, First is that version, which is an app on your phone. There are many uh, devotionals that you can do there. They have um, a Bible passage and a small devotional for you to read as a family or by yourself. Uh, These two books are are two that I'm reading through myself at the moment. The Christmas We Didn't Expect is all about who Jesus is, the things that he's done, uh, and the promises that he came to fulfill. And so you look really deeply at um, how unexpected that first Christmas was and all that it did. A Jesus Christmas is a new book uh, that's been put out by um, the Good Book Company, and this is more of a family devotional. And they're really trying to help you engage and enter into this Christmas story. Uh, And they have great questions to help uh, spark further conversation. So I'd recommend this one for a dinner time kind of devotional. You can read it over dinner and ask those questions. Um, There's a few other things. This is another great one that you can do as a family and create ornaments and traditions around it as well. The names of Jesus. Um, They have the different names from throughout the Bible that talk of who Jesus is and, again, all that he is and all that he's done. And you can hang them up on your trees uh, or around your house to celebrate that and be reminded in the month beforehand. Um, The Jesse Tree Advent is another one similar to that. And, again, it kind of requires, like, making ornaments. So it becomes a yearly thing that you do together, reading the Bible and hanging up these ornaments and remembering the Bible story all the way from Genesis Uh, through to the birth of Jesus Uh, and you can make your own and I even found some colouring pages. All of these are on the kids drive that I've created uh, for us at St Mark's so if you'd like this PowerPoint or the links just come and find me and I'll send them through. Uh, But 
Yeah, let me leave you with uh, a note of excitement and as we look forward, anticipation. Uh, in the simple words of the carol, um, O come, all ye faithful, it says, O come, let us adore him, Christ our Lord. And how good it is that we can do that this year uh, together and in our households. Let me pray. Father God, thank you for Jesus, that you sent your own son to this earth to be our saviour uh, and to bring us into relationship with you. Help us to prepare our hearts this Christmas to adore him and love you all the more. We pray these things in his name. Amen. All right. Well, the kids are going to go to their programs now. We've got K-2 downstairs with Lauren and Sarah, and preschool uh, will be up in the annex with Rachel and I. Thank you, Sarah, and some yeah, great practical examples for uh, young and old to really um, remember and reflect on um, Advent year leading up to Christmas. All right, we're going to hear about um, what happened um, at our gingerbread event yesterday. And can I ask um, Sylvia to come to the front? Or there might be a video. had gingerbread house yesterday. Uh, it was really tiring. <laughs> oh my goodness. I have a newfound respect for Alison and all that she has contributed in the past few years. It's crazy tiring. Um, but yes, yeah, such a great day. Thank God for the beautiful weather. It was nice and cool. Um, imagine if it was the week before where we were all melting. Um, so 52 people came yesterday um, and uh, seemed like a very fun day. Everybody seemed to have a really good time. A lot of teenagers came and brought their friends, which is really exciting. Um, Cell and uh, Cashlin got to share their testimony, uh, which was really cool. Um, and uh, so Joyce and I haven't read the uh, results yet from, of the survey, but I think it's pretty positive so far. <laughs> um, um, and then, oh, yeah, so somebody even suggested that we have competition next year, so we'll see. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, all in all, thank you so much for your prayers. Uh, it was a great time. Like, the whole point of it was to send out invitations to carols um, and also just to build connections, and I think we, we did that pretty well yesterday, so thank God for that, yeah. So, um, and also thank God for so many people who came without even having to build a gingerbread house, like Alice and Di and so many others who have just contributed behind the scenes and it was 
Wonderful. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sylvie, for the update. And to Joyce and the whole team, yeah. So 52 people, there's a great attendance. Yeah, so it looks like they had a great great time with um, all the pictures that we, sh we just saw. All right, we're going to just have a, a brief um, mission update for our um, missionaries Peter and Terry Blouse in Argentina. So um, they've sent some pictures through. I'm also going to pray for them later in our prayer time. So... Where they are in Argentina, it's doing it tough. There's a lot of um, uh, people getting COVID. Um, it's quite um, uh, heavily um, populated with uh, lots of um, high-rise apartments, and uh, it's very hard for people to socially distance. Um, they've been doing a lot of things uh, via Zoom. Uh, they found it very challenging at times with the universities because um, um, that's where they mostly um, uh, serve, with university students. Uh, trying to train them up. So it's been a very challenging year as it has been for everyone. Um, on some of the slides, um, uh, a lot of them are doing um, preparation exams. And on the slide before, thanks, Edgar. Yeah, just um, uh, Peter and Terry's Blau's daughter, Rosie, she's been stuck overseas, but thankfully got home recently. And also down below, um, they do a lot of WhatsApp chat groups and also Zoom as well just for their ministry talks and um, Bible studies. So I'm just going to read out um, a small uh, prayer from them on behalf of the whole church. So, dear friends, this strange year is ending, but Christmas reminds us that the love of God demonstrated in the gift of his son is a historical reality that our modern experiences cannot change. This foundation keeps us looking ahead, beyond COVID-19 and all the unknowns of the year ahead. The assurance that our God is with us, will continue to glorify himself through his people. We're so thankful to God for all, for all of the fruit he has given us this year. We pray that you and your family can also reflect on the many ways God has blessed you and rejoice in him. I suspect the two of us will celebrate Christmas together alone, just as well we enjoy each other's company, though. Pray that we might be able to point our neighbours to God's love. Thank you again for your prayers. We depend on them, and God is using them, Peter and Terry. And we're going to pray for them um, further as well during our, our church prayer time. Right, we're going to kindly have our Bible readings now, uh, followed by our sermon today. Just ask our brother Max to come up, and um, reading from New Testament passage, and then followed by our sister Queenie. morning I'm going to read about peace and hope so Romans chapter 5 1 to 11 therefore since we have been justified through faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by the faith in this grace in which we now stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God not only so but we also glory also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous pe person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since now we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now reconciliation.
The next reading is from Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirits of the Lord will rest on him, the spirits of wisdom and of understanding, the spirits of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy, With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. The young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infants will play near the cobra's den. And the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the roots of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him and his resting place will be glorious. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the surviving remnants of his people from Assyria, from Lower Egypt, from Upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamath, and from the islands of the Mediterranean. (laughs) He will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. Ephraim's jealousy will vanish and Judah's enemies will be destroyed. Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah, nor Judah hostile towards Ephraim. They will swoop down on the slopes of Philistia to the west. Together they will plunder the people to the east. They will subdue Edom and Moab and the Ammonites will be subject to them. The Lord will dry up the gulf of the Egyptian sea. With a scorching wind, he will sweep his hand over the Euphrates River. He will break it up into seven streams so that anyone can cross over in sandals. There will be a highway for the remnants of his people that is left from Assyria, as there was for Israel when they came up from Egypt. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to all joining us on the live stream. I'm Alex. I'm the Acting Rector at St Mark's. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this special time of year that we, as we uh, uh, can uh, spend this time thinking and reflecting uh, in, in hope and anticipation of, uh, of Christmas, celebrating the birth of the Lord Jesus, but also uh, looking to his coming again. Uh, Please be with us now as we look at your word, as we consider peace and what that means for us and for our world. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we started a new series looking at the big themes of Advent. Last week we looked at hope, that despite all the uncertainty of life, we can have real hope, lasting hope, for salvation from our sins and that one day all that's wrong with our world will be put right through Jesus, our Messiah. And we heard those beautiful words uh, from Isaiah, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, which ties in rather nicely with this week as we come to the second instalment in our series, which is peace. And peace is an important theme. It's important. It's an important ideal to pursue because, well, well, let's be honest. The the world is so lacking in peace. We all long for peace in our lives. 
Uh, so many people, their lives are full of worry and anxiety, their relationships, conflict and stress. The world uh, is full of conflict and war. Uh, someone once said there will never be agreement at the peace tables of the world or rest in the individual heart until the Prince of Peace reigns supreme in the hearts of men. And so that's where Jesus comes in. Uh, last week we were reminded that Jesus is our hope, but not only is he our hope, he is also our peace. And when the, the angels announced the, the birth of the Messiah to the shepherds on the hillside that first Christmas Eve, they proclaimed, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. Only in Christ will we ever truly obtain peace on earth. And so today, as we consider peace and what it means, we'll do so by looking at four aspects of the peace that Jesus brings. Jesus brings peace with God. Uh, Jesus brings peace with self. Jesus brings peace with others. And finally, Jesus will bring peace on earth. So let's start with the first one, Jesus brings peace with God. So when God first sent the angel Gabriel to Mary, he sent Gabriel with a message of peace. Luke 1, 26 to 30, it says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Elizabeth, Mary's cousin, mother to John the Baptist, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. Unsurprisingly, Mary was troubled by the angel's greeting, but the angel spoke words of peace and assurance to her, telling her, don't be afraid, God is with you. Uh, you've found favour with God. But how had Mary found favour with God? Uh, the, uh, the only way uh, any of us find favour with God, really. Uh, maybe Mary had faith in God's promise to one day send the Messiah. Uh, maybe she had uh, read her Old Testament and was pinning her hopes on God fulfilling his promise to Israel in sending the Messiah. But, but more likely, God bestowed his favour on, upon Mary, not because of anything intrinsic about her, but really just as an expression and sign of his grace. Uh, but God also sent an angel to Joseph, Mary's husband-to-be, and the angel told Joseph in Matthew 1 that Mary would give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus because he will save their, his people from their sins. And, that, and that's, as we know, what Jesus means. It means saviour, and he was given that name uh, because as promised saviour, he is the one who brings us peace with God. When John the Baptist was born three months before Jesus, John's father, Zechariah, filled with the Holy Spirit, prophesied about John. Uh, Here's hear Zechariah's words uh, from Luke 1. He said, And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through forgiveness of their sins, to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the reason why I share all these passages with you is because I think there's an assumption in these passages. And the assumption is, is that we are not at peace with God. The world is not at peace with God. Humanity is not at peace with God. They weren't then and certainly not now. And we know, as we've worked through Hosea, we know Israel's sordid and sorry history of, of unfaithfulness and adultery and, and, and 
alliances with, with, uh, with, with other nations. They'd prostituted themselves. And Israel, representative of really the entire human race, uh, to, to all of us, Paul says in Colossians 1, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour. We were alienated from God, he says. We were estranged from God, no longer on speaking terms with God. That was Israel's plight, wasn't it? And Paul doesn't put too fine a point on it when he says in Romans 5, we were enemies, enemies with God because of our sin. Our sins have separated us from God. And if you're enemies with someone then you can't be at peace with them. Who will broker peace between us and God? Well, of course, Jesus. And God sent Jesus to make peace, to bring peace between us and God. And Romans 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace which we now stand. Only through Jesus and faith in him are we brought into that relationship of peace with God, our creator. And this is achieved by Jesus on the cross. Jesus was born into the world, as, as Sarah said at the, uh, near the top of the service, that we look at Jesus' as birth through the lens of his death. Jesus was born into this world to die on a cross, to take the punishment for our sins that is rightly ours. He took it upon himself so that we can be forgiven and so that we can be restored to right relationship of peace with God. And we read about this in Isaiah 53, as Isaiah 700... 800 whatever years before the birth of Christ prophesied the coming Messiah prophesied his death he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities the punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we were healed and Paul says in Romans 5 from verse 8 but God demonstrates his own love for us in this whilst we were still sinners Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? But I wonder if you noticed in Romans, I wonder if you noticed the posture that we now assume. Romans 5 verse 2. Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. How can a human being stand in the presence of the holy God? How can a guilty sinner stand before a just judge? Is it by personal merit? Is it on the basis of all of our good works? Is it by our religious performance? Do we come before God standing on our own two feet, trusting in our own personal righteousness? No, not at all. It is only by grace. Only by grace. To stand in God's presence, to survive in God's presence can only be a gift. It's never deserved. It's never earned. And it's not a reward for who we are or what we've done. And we see in these verses in Romans something of the way that grace operates for those who believe in Christ. 
It, it, it involves, firstly, a legal acquittal that comes through faith. It's not because of what we've done. It's not our works. We are justified through faith, just if I'd never sinned. It's a legal acquittal. And it establishes a, a permanent relationship or, or status of peace between us and between God. We have peace with God. It is achieved by and through no one else but the Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have gained access. And it is effective only by faith in Christ. That's the essential thing that links all that Jesus is and does and all that he has achieved for us. It's by faith. The effect of all, that, all of that is that we can come into God's presence and stand in his presence because we are saved, we are redeemed, we are acquitted because of his grace. And so that gives the, the writer of the letter to the Hebrews um, the ability to say, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Hebrews 4, verse 16. So that's really the, the first and the, the most important thing for us to know about peace, is that Jesus brings peace with God. He brings peace with God through his blood shed on the cross for us. But having brought us peace, we are now actually in a position to find peace with ourselves. Jesus brings peace with self. You see, sin not only separates us from God, but sin also brings separation within our own being. Uh, as humans, we are often conflicted beings. Uh, we're constantly fighting anxiety and stress and inner turmoil. And, and Scripture affirms this. Scripture says we are at war with ourselves. When we are in sin, we are at war with ourselves. Uh, Paul says this in Romans 7. He laments his, uh, I guess, his human uh, condition. Uh, and, and I love this, this, this passage um, because uh, it speaks directly to my heart. Uh, he says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature... For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, that I keep on doing. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, war, waging war against the law of my mind and making a prisoner to the law of sin. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's the war Paul's talking about that's going on inside us. And similarly, in Galatians 5, he says, uh, and it says there's an antidote to this. He says, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not uh, to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And so the good news of Galatians 5 is that although we, we have this war that's going on uh, within us, 
We're, we're called to live by the Spirit, and, and Paul declares that, that we are called to be free. Galatians 5 verse 13, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Free from sin. Free from the consequences of sin. Uh, free to enjoy relationship with God. Free to enjoy peace with God. And we desperately need this inner peace. And Jesus came not only to, to bring peace with God, but also peace within ourselves. And the secret to finding peace with self, I think, is learning to live by the Spirit. When you put your faith in Christ, you not only receive peace with God, you also receive the peace of God to help you find peace with yourself, to, uh, to be able to live amongst the difficult circumstances of life. When you know Christ, even though everything can be going crazy around you, you can still be at peace with yourself. I think Philippians 4 is instructive. You'll know this passage well. Um, Paul says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, now hear these beautiful words of our Lord Jesus from John 14. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus not only brings peace with God, he also brings peace with with self. Jesus also brings peace with others. When we trust in Jesus, when we trust in the Prince of Peace, well then we can ask him to come and, and to bring peace into our relationships, uh, to intervene, to reconcile, to restore. We read uh, about this in Ephesians 2 where Jesus came to to bring peace between Jews and, and Gentiles. Uh, Paul says, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. So whatever the conflict may be over, finding peace, well, it will often involve God doing his work on us on ourselves, rather than what we may want, God doing his work on them, the person we're in conflict with. You see, learning to live in peace with difficult relationships, conflict, uh, relationships that are marked by conflict, um, it, it's more often about us learning to change ourselves rather than us seeking change in them. Because actually, when we seek change in other people, that rarely works. Listen to Paul's words in Romans 12. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We are the ones who need to transform. We are the ones who need to be renewed. And he says, verse 3, Do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. How many arguments, how many conflicts occur because we think too highly of ourselves? Sober judgment. It's about being realistic about ourselves. Understanding how the other person's behaviour uh, affects us, how it might push our buttons. And only from that position of understanding who we are and, 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 and what we're like and, uh, and all of that, only from that position can we intentionally respond appropriately, not, not react, but 
respond. It's not about condoning bad behaviour and it's not about assuming responsibility for something we might not have caused. It's about responding appropriately. Verse 9 of Romans, Love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, honour one another above yourselves. I think if we did that, it would go a long way to uh, reducing conflict. All our duty as Christians is summed up in this one word, love, which happens to be the Advent, Advent theme which we'll look at next week, which Jason will, will preach on. Jesus came to break down barriers. He came to bridge gaps. He, he came to bring people together, to bring them together with each other and with God, to restore peace to our damaged relationships. And as believers in Christ, we are called to follow in his footsteps. Colossians 3, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace. Jesus brings peace with God. Jesus brings peace with self. Jesus brings peace with others. And finally, Jesus will bring peace on earth. The angel, the, the angel's announcement to the shepherds that first Christmas Eve was a proclama proclamation of peace, the peace that Jesus would bring to our planet. Luke 2, suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favour rests. This is the peace prophesied by Isaiah. And we can read his wonderful prophecy about Jesus back in Isaiah 2. Uh, Isaiah 2 verse 4, he will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. These weapons of war will be turned into weapon, uh, for, for instruments for, for farming and uh, for, uh, for, for creating. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. I long for a day the day that we can imagine all people living in peace. It seems completely unattainable, doesn't it? But then we read Isaiah 9, as we did last week, and we find these, these words, these beautiful words about the one who will ultimately bring peace on earth. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. This is a clear prophecy about Jesus who was born as a child who will be called Prince of Peace and who will one day rule in peace over the entire planet. But it gets even better than that because this peace on earth will, will not only just bring an end to war among the nations, this peace will, it will affect the whole of creation Look at this wonderful picture of, of the future peace, this perfect peace that we see in Isaiah's prophecy uh, in, in chapter 11. This is, this is the world returning to what it must have been like prior to the fall. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, 
for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Imagine the earth, the entire planet filled with the knowledge of the love, uh, the knowledge of the Lord. But it gets better than even that because the Bible tells us that Jesus will not only bring peace on earth, but but the whole of creation, the whole world, the whole the, the heavens and the earth, everything will be reconciled to God. All things in heaven and on earth. Colossians 1. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now, we only have glimpses of this now, and so this is why Advent is so important, because Advent, as I've said before, reminds us to look back to Christ's first coming, to his birth, his death and resurrection, but it pushes us forward to look to the future, to his second coming, when all of these promises of Isaiah and the other prophets will be fulfilled. Jesus truly is our Prince of Peace. And the reason Jesus brings peace with God, peace with self, peace with others and peace on earth, it all goes back to the cross. Without Jesus shedding his blood on the cross, there would be no peace. There would be no promise of peace. And without Jesus being born as a baby at Christmas, there would be, well, there would be no cross. So let me ask you as I finish, are you at peace with God this morning? Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins so that you can be forgiven and restored to a right relationship with God. If your faith is in Christ, then you are at peace with God. Perhaps a slightly trickier question. Do you have peace with yourself this morning? If your faith is in Christ, then Jesus has not abandoned you, but has come to live in you by his Holy Spirit. And he offers you his peace. Maybe an even more awkward question. Are you at peace with others this morning? Surely, if we have peace with God, peace with ourselves, then we can have peace with others. And we are called, I think, as Christians to be peacemakers. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. If your faith is in Christ, then he has given you all the resources you need to do your part in living in peaceful relationships with those around you, to work for peace, to push for peace. You see, peacemaking, it tries to build bridges to people. It doesn't destroy bridges, it builds bridges. It doesn't want animosity to remain. It wants and strives for reconciliation. It wants harmony And so we pray and we take whatever practical initiatives that we can to make peace. Aware, though, peace may not come, but at least we've done our part. Do we have peace on earth this morning? Well, oh, how I wish we did. We don't have peace yet, not on earth. But there is the promise of peace to come. And at this time, we look forward to the fulfilment of all of God's promises. The angels proclaiming to the shepherds on that first Christmas Eve, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favour rests. Those words of promise, they still ring in the air this Advent season as we worship and as we adore the Lord Jesus, our Saviour the Son of God, the Prince of Peace. Amen.
Well, thank you, Alex, for a great talk. Yeah, it's um, really uh, amazing to really think about um, all the different and wonderful ways that Jesus brings us peace in so many different things within ourselves and the world around us. Yeah, so it's uh, good to reflect on that for everyone. All right, we're going to spend some time in prayer now. As part of a Christian church, it's important to express our love and commitment to God. One way to do this is to read and follow the Nicene Creed, which is a brief statement of the Christian faith. I'm just going to read that out on behalf of the church. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was encountered of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets, we believe in one holy, universal, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and for the life of the world to come. Amen. All right, we're going to continue in um, church prayer. We can kind of ask our sister Sylvia to come up again just to um, lead us in prayer. Thanks, Sylvia. Please join me in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we sincerely thank you for the life and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, through whom we have salvation and everlasting life. We thank you for your bountiful compassion and mercy on us, that while we were still sinners, you loved us and opened your, our ears and hearts to hear and believe and accept your wonderful invitation to be in your family. Lord, please sustain us by the indwelling of your Holy Spirit, that we may remain true to the faith given to us once for all. Father, we pray for Thirst Youth Group, the youths who attend, and also for the leaders, namely Jason, Anita, Ben, Kieran, and Rachel. We thank you for their faithful service to our youths and their commitment to serving them week in and week out to see our youths grow in their knowledge and love of Christ. Thank you that Youth Group is able to meet up this year despite the pandemic. And even though it has wrapped up for the year, we pray that both leaders and youths will continue to grow in joy in the gospel. Father, we pray for the men and women who serve as parish counsellors in our church. We thank you for their diligent service to us over this year, ensuring that important decisions are made for the sake of seeing the gospel proclaimed faithfully in our parish. We pray for Ian, Wilson, Angela, Irene, Simon, Edgar, Q, Alan and Jeanette. And we pray that you may bless them with all, with all unity of heart and mind and fervency to see your kingdom grow. Father, we thank you for the nursing home ministry um, that it was able to commence again. We pray for the elderly, especially those who have not yet accepted Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. We pray that through visitations and through this ministry that some may come and hear the truth and be saved. Lord, we pray for missionaries who serve in remote territories or abroad. We recognise that you call all believers to go and make disciples of all nations. And we thank you that we can partner with our brothers and sisters through prayer and financial and practical support. 
We pray for their spiritual growth, God, that in the pain of loneliness and despair or discouragement, that they may look towards Jesus to find peace, love and joy. Please let your presence be felt and known by them during times of hardship and discouragement. And please fill them with your strength so that they may not give into temptation at a moment of weakness, but help them to continue to turn to Jesus for inspiration and energy to persevere in godliness. Father, we pray for the leaders in, um, in the Anglican Diocese, in the Sydney Anglican Diocese, namely our Archbishop Glenn Davies and our Bishop Michael Stead. We pray that you will give them wisdom and courage to hold firm to the teaching of Scripture and to publicly defend it despite growing hostility against your word. Help them to lead with humility and in prayerful dependence on your power to, per- to preserve and grow your church here. Father, we pray for Pete and Terry Blouse and for their work at Buenos Aires, Argentina. We thank you that the number of COVID-19 cases have reduced recently in the region and that isolation rules have loosened. And we thank you so much, Lord, that out of the, um, their training, uh, the ministry training uh, team of five, that all five have committed themselves to serve you in whatever place you put them in. We thank you that despite the pandemic, um, Bible study and training courses have been able to continue online. We thank you that your, continue, your kingdom continues to grow and that nothing can st- stop your word from spreading, not even, a, not even a pandemic. Thank you, Lord, that Rosie is uh, back in Sydney and that she's finished her quarantine. Please help um, settle her back into um, Sydney life and to be able to find work. Uh, Father, we pray for the ministry that Pete and Terry are part of. We pray for the uni students in their cell group uh, who are finishing this year um, in a very confused situation, uh, feeling quite insecure about the future of their courses and whether they will be, will be able to get back uh, to a physical class. We pray that they will be able to keep encouraging each other and to put Jesus first, whatever happens. Lord, please give Pete and Terry protection um, in in the changing world of COVID-19 as they are regarded as uh, vulnerable. uh, Please prevent them from catching the disease. Um, And as they've been homebound for the last few months, it's been quite restless for the both of them. So we pray, Father, that you will give them an opportunity to get out of Buenos Aires for a few weeks um, and just to be able to be refreshed and rejuvenated, um, to, uh, yeah, to be energised to continue in the ministry. Lord, you know exactly what they're going through and you know exactly what they need. So please provide for them, Lord. And Father, we commit all these things to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Sylvia, for your heartfelt prayer for the church. All right, we're learning a lot about what peace is really about. So what better way is to sing that now for our next song, Peace Unto Us.
peace unto us. All right, uh, we're just having a few uh, church announcements now. Um, this uh, Thursday, we're going to have a, a combined big church um, prayer meeting uh, via Zoom, so not here. Um, it's, uh, so this Thursday, 10th of December at 8 to 9 p.m., uh, please refer to the weekly newsletter regarding to the meeting ID and password. We've got opportunity just to um, pray together in Thanksgiving and just for the year we had and, and the year um, for next year and um, approaching to Christmas and also just um, being prayerful of the uh, Poole family who will be joining us uh, next year as well. So uh, please encourage you just to uh, join us next Thursday night, uh, 8 to 9 p.m. Oh, Gav's joining us as well. Okay, hot off the press. So Gav will be there as well. So that'll be really good too. Um, also, thinking ahead um, on uh, Christmas Day services, um, it was in the newsletter, but uh, we're going to run a few uh, services um, because of COVID so that um, everyone has opportunity to come uh, for Christmas. It's great that we can meet face-to-face. The service times will be, uh, and they'll be identical, will be Christmas Eve, uh, 6 p.m., um, and also the traditional service normally on Christmas Day, 8.30, but also another uh, family service repeated at, at 9.30 uh, on Christmas Day. So there's no way to predict who will come to which service. So um, uh, St. Mark's requires you to uh, book in uh, for which um, service you'd like to attend. So it's not, not up on the screen, but if you go to uh, malabar.church forward slash events, and that will lead you to a link uh, where you can make... Um, uh, reserve a seat for the you know, hotly uh, contested seats at St. Mark's so you can be part of the um, yeah, church services. Yeah, so really good to be able to meet in person. Is that in the yes, yes, usually, yeah. So, um, yeah, so just click on the link there as well. Yeah, yeah but uh, um, seats are limited, so please uh, first come, first serve for that. All right, and um, just thinking further ahead in March. It's got some slides on the screen. Some of you might recognise this place. It's been a while. It feels like a long time ago. We just scroll through them. Um, it's, uh, it looks very empty and clean, so not made it quite recognisable. But yeah, it's our church retreat uh, held in uh, yeah at the Youth Work Centre at Port Hacking. So it's on next year, God willing. So yeah, so um, something to look forward to. And that date is uh, 19th to 21st of March next year, so please uh, lock that in. There's something to look forward to. I remember March, April this year, it was like no one knew what was happening and should we go to this, should we go to that? And our Katoomba Easter conference was on there as well and it was hard to know what was happening. But yeah, so it's been a, a strange year. But yeah, but something to look forward to um, Yeah, uh, in March next year. So yeah, just kindly mark that on your dates. And also just um, a final word on our financial givings. Thank you on behalf of the church of all your financial givings. Um, it does support uh, the church and the staff here and, and all the, um, the services that we provide in a very difficult year. Um, please, I encourage you to um, please uh, continue giving, uh, whether it be through the two red everything boxes here at the church or preferably even online because it's just much easier in terms of just uh, regular giving. So thank you for your contributions and for um, further ahead. All right, uh, we're almost finished now. Um, those who are here, we're going to have uh, morning tea, but it's good to reflect on Alex's sermon today on peace. There was so much that uh, we could learn. Um, the things I learned from it was that, um, and there's too much to cover uh, in a few sentences, but we're at war ourselves, we're very sinful, and uh, we're, in so, we're in so in need of peace. And Jesus provides uh, peace in, in so many important ways. And we're unable to stand before God by ourselves or by our merit, but we do need someone to intercede for us. And that was only possible through God's love for us and Jesus' death on the cross and the shedding of his blood. And because of that, um, we can have peace with God and, and peace with ourselves. And in ways, um, it helps us to reflect on that in terms of our uh, connections with, with each other. And Alex said in his sermon, if... If we just like reflect on these and pray and, and have God's peace, then um, the world would definitely be a, a better place. 
So I encourage you all just to think about that, to be challenged by that, and uh, some of the questions that Alex had at the end of his talk about uh, what we can uh, do in, in regards to peace. Um, I wish you well, uh, peace to us all, and uh, yeah, just uh, for the morning tea ahead, just to um, be mindful of our uh, COVID restrictions, and uh, please be seated uh, when you um, chat and mingle, and uh, thank you for those who have joined us on the live stream today. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>